You are about to hear a story based on actual events. To protect the innocent, names and places have been changed. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers bring you Mr. Ray Milland in a story taken from life. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents The Log of the Marne, a true story concerning a British gunboat trapped by communist fire 140 miles from help, starring Mr. Ray Milland. Harlow, what's that? Why, Hap, that's my Autolite Stay Full Battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Mm, Looks like a sure starter, Harlow. Ah, dependable as a die, Hap. And what's more, it's famous among car owners everywhere because the Autolite Stay Full needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And it gives longer life, too, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Sounds like a winning combination to me, Harlow. Right you are, Hap, and you can get one at your nearest Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries. To quickly find his name, just call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. That's me, and I'll gladly tell you the location of your nearest Autolite battery dealer where you can have your battery checked this week. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with The Log of the Marne and the performance of Mr. Ray Milland, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! Log entry, HMS Marne, entered this day by Lieutenant Commander James G. Harland, officer in command. According to statements by surviving officers and men, the situation of the vessel during the morning, 20th of June, 1949, was as follows. Maan was proceeding west in the Ming Kiang River on a routine supply mission from Fuchao to Yenping. According to edicts issued by the Chinese People's Liberation Army, Maan had more than 14 hours of grace in which to reach her destination. But at 20 minutes past nine, the communist land battery opened fire. The second shell struck the wheelhouse. Three of the five men there were killed. All communication to and from the wheelhouse was destroyed and the Marne immediately went off course. Meanwhile, two consecutive direct hits were suffered by the bridge. All personnel there, including the captain, were either killed or wounded. Second in command, Lieutenant Bennett Moore, in spite of shell fragments in his right lung and side, alone on the bridge, had control of his faculties until the arrival of Lieutenant Hugh Fraser. Henry, sir! Fraser reporting, sir! Good Good Lord, Moore! (laughs) I'm all right. I was in command, Fraser. I'm glad you came up. Is the captain dead? (laughs) Not yet. How about the others? Some of them, yes. We're off course, Fraser. I can't contact the wheelhouse. Signal the engine room, will you? Full speed astern, both. Right. Full speed astern, both. Get a bearing on the battery. We'll return fire. No response from the engine room, boy. Look, try again, try again, quickly. We'll run aground. It's no use, boy. They don't answer. Something's been damaged. Why is this happening? Why did they fire on us? I'll try the transmitting station. Bridge, TS. Bridge, TS. Bridge. Transmitting station. Nothing. No communication at all. Everything's gone. We haven't fired one round back. I'll try to get down to the engine room. Perhaps I can. It's no use, Fraser. No use. We're going aground. Fifteen minutes after the attack was opened, Marne was aground. Neither A guns nor B guns were able to bear on target since her stern was toward the battery. Consequently, X gun was ordered into local control. There was no care for the wounded. The sick bay had been hit. The medical officer and his assistant killed. X gun got off three rounds, then it was hit. The entire gun crew being killed. Small arms were issued since they were the only remaining weapons. Winston, you seen the first lieutenant? Yes, sir. I think he's just forward. Thank you. 
Moore? Oh, yes, Fraser. Over here. Right. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm all right. Oh, it's 50 caliber. I wish they would send boarders, then they'd stop firing. I don't expect them now. <coughs> they would have sent them. They seem to have decided to reduce us to wreckage. Do you think we can abandon the ship of the wounded? Get to the national side of the river. No, there aren't enough lifeboats left. They've seen to that, the rotten... I said they've stopped. Oh, why shouldn't they? Look what they've done to us. <laughs> June 21st, the following day, I received orders in Hong Kong to proceed by air to Marne to take along medical supplies and a medical officer, Lieutenant Robert Lamb. Our Sunderland was fired upon as we landed. Although we sustained enough damage to make it impossible to transfer all of the supplies, we considered ourselves fortunate to have half aboard when the flying boat was forced to leave. It was put to immediate use by the M.O. and I was taken to the officer in command. In here, sir. Oh, yes. We've had to use the radar room as a command center, sir. Almost everything else has been knocked out. I see. I shall want a complete report on the condition of the ship after I speak to Moore. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think he's fit to carry on, Fraser? Oh, no, sir, no. I'm uh, surprised that he's still alive. He's, he's not able to stand now. Oh, poor devil. Uh, here we are, sir. Uh, who is it? It's Fraser, Bennett. Oh. oh I, I heard a plane, didn't I? I'm sure I did. Yes. Uh, Sunderland brought a doctor and medicine, Bennett. Uh, this is Lieutenant Commander Harland, Lieutenant Moore. Oh, I... oh don't try Moore. Oh, thank you, sir. The uh, C&C asked me to convey his admiration for what you've done, Moore. Oh, thank you, sir. Do I understand that I'm being relieved of my command? Good Lord, you've done all you can. You're in no condition to go on. I'm all right, sir. I feel much better than I did yesterday. I, I'm sorry, Moore. My orders are to assume command. I can't do anything else. Yes, sir. Now, uh, Fraser, I should like to meet with the other executive officers. There's only one now, sir. Oh? Phil's died this morning. There's only Alden and myself now, sir. I see. Then I shall want to meet him if you could suggest a place. This is Lieutenant Alden, sir. How do you do, sir? Oh, how do you do? Uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you, sir. You've uh, had quite a go. Yes, sir. And I don't think any of us would mind if we knew the reason behind it. We were told that the communists had promised us 14 hours to reach Yenping. They had. So we were entirely within our right, but they fired on us. There's been no explanation. Dispatches were sent to their headquarters immediately we received your message. Uh, when were you shelled last? This morning. When we were sending some of the wounded ashore to the nationalists. Oh. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. They sent a junk out last night, and we asked them to come back at dawn with some more boats. They told us they'd see them safely to Fu Chao, but the men who really need help couldn't go. They were too torn up to live through the journey. How many did you send? Forty-two, sir. How many seriously wounded are there? Thirty-five, sir. And how many dead? Thirty-one, sir. Your original complement was 149. Yes, sir. There are 41 of us left. I see. But we still have power. Oh, yes, sir. They fared quite well below decks. But the communication between the bridge and the engine room was knocked out. Is there anyone aboard who can repair it? I'm not sure, Oh, sir. yes, Fraser. Lillis has left. Oh, I wasn't sure, sir. Well, he can do it. Are you going to try to refloat her, sir? Make a run for it? Refloat her, if possible, yes. I'd uh, like to be ready to make a run for it if we're ordered to. Uh, what about the guns? They're all gone, sir. <sighs> what about fuel? Oh, depends on how long we stay, sir. We were to refuel in Yenping. I'm afraid navigation will be a bit of a problem, sir. The charts were burned. Uh huh. Well, we shall have to do with what we have, won't we? Yes, yes sir. sir. Then I'd like every available man put to work at once on the foredeck. I'd like everything that is heavy and can be broken loose moved aft. In the meantime, I want any water ballast and all the fuel oil in the forward tanks pumped out. Over the side, sir? Yes. I think the loss of fuel oil at the moment is not as important as getting Marn afloat again. June 22nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th were required to repair communications and lighten the bow. Small arms fire raked the decks occasionally and reminded us that the communists were watching our every move. Hoping to put them off guard, I therefore halted all activity until the 2nd of July, and then shortly after midnight, assisted by a moonless night, we raised steam and backed off to anchor without incident. Morale improved immediately. June 23rd. 
July 15th. An attempt to shift our berth was answered by a 30-minute barrage. It was obvious that the communists would destroy us if we tried to leave. July 18th. Shortly after midday, communist forces were seen crossing the river below us against no nationalist resistance of any kind. Later that same day, they crossed above us as well, and we realized that we were completely cut off. I ordered all ventilation shut off to conserve fuel. July 20th. After a month had passed, we had our first direct contact with the communists. A Major Kung requested me to come ashore to talk with him. I accepted his invitation and met him in a hut a short distance from the river. I wish to make it clear that your ship will not be molested if she does not move and that there is no more trouble from your ship. Trouble? You realize that this would not have happened if you had not fired first. I think you're mistaken. You fired first, and I would appreciate safe passage down the river. I cannot grant you a safe passage. It is up to my superiors. But first, you must admit that you fired first. July 26th. To conserve our already meager food stores, officers and men were put on half rations. One refrigerator was put out of service to save more fuel. On July 28th, I again met Major Kung. I talked to my superiors. They tell me you give you safe passage down the river. Oh, well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. You are not too unhappy aboard your ship? No, not at all. But you would like to go down the river? Yes, especially since you have absolutely no reason to hold us here. Ah. I can give you safe passage if the British side will acknowledge that they invaded Chinese waters without the authority of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. This will be a document. The word invaded cannot be used. It is the most serious word to use. There may be some difference between the Chinese wording and the English wording. I am speaking of the Chinese wording. The word invade means to commit a hostile act, which we did not do. You cannot use the word invade. Do you admit that your ship was guilty of entering the river? Guilty of entering the river? It was not a guilty act, and you cannot use the word invade. It means that we are at war, and we are not. We are a friendly nation and always have been. If you do not wish to cooperate, I suggest that we leave this until a later meeting. I insist that we continue this discussion. Then you are ready to admit the British guilt. I think the subject at hand is your guilt. You are holding a British ship and British subjects under the threat of destruction. You are causing great suffering. Lack of fuel oil has caused me to stop the ventilation system in midsummer. My food is spoiling because I can't run the refrigerators. There's a danger that even drinking water will be unavailable. You are responsible for the condition of that ship and the welfare of the officers and men. Then you do admit British guilt? I do not. Then I suggest that we leave this for a later meeting. I warn you, too. If you move the ship, every effort will be made to destroy it. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ray Milland in The Log of the Marne, tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Hap, uh, what's the surest thing in the world? Mm, you got me, Harlow. <laughs> Why, starting your car if you've got an Autolite stay full battery. Hap, it's tops in dependable starting power. And it needs water only three times a year, eh, Harlow? Right. Only three times a year in normal car use. That's because the Autolite Stay Full has three times the liquid reserve of ordinary batteries. And the Autolite Stay Full gives longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. There's not a better battery built. And it's carried by your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries and has special test equipment. If a new battery is needed, he also has an Autolite Stay Full for your car. So take a tip from me. See your Autolite battery dealer this week. 
To quickly find his name, just telephone Western Union by number. And ask for Operator 25. That's me, and I'll gladly tell you the location of your nearest Autolite battery dealer. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Ray Milland in Elliot Lewis's production of The Log of the Marne, a dramatic report well calculated to keep you in suspense. Entire months of July and August were taken up with trying to maintain life in an all but dead ship and in pointless, decisionless meetings with the communists. I, over and over again, repeated my demands for oil. They repeated their demands that I admit British guilt. By September 9th, conditions aboard were quite serious. Officers and men were without any of the conveniences afforded by a modern ship, and they were almost without food. Morrell was at its lowest ebb when I heard a shout from the deck. Junks, coming down the river. Junks. I think they're carrying oil. 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 Captain Harlan, I think they're giving us our oil. It was Admiralty fuel seized by the communists when they took Yenping. They charged more than 400 pounds for its delivery, but it put life into the Marne. The drums were brought aboard by hand pulley and emptied in almost dry tanks. Everyone, officers and men, buckled down to the job. It took 11 hours, and when it was finished, every man on the ship was exhausted, but happier than they'd been for 100 days. Good morning, sir. You sent for me? Uh, yes, come in, Fraser. Yes, sir. How much fuel oil did we take aboard last night? Uh, 296 drums, sir. Hmm? That's uh, approximately 56 tons. Yes, well, uh, that should do us nicely. Oh, yes, sir, it already has. Ventilation's running again. It reached 136 degrees in the engine room yesterday. Yes, yes, I know it's uncomfortable. Uh, Fraser, I'd like to have you arrange a working party. Yes, sir. I want the anchor cable lashed with bedding. But first, I want the bedding to be soaked thoroughly in soft soap and grease. The anchor cables? Are... Yes, Every time the ship swings at her moorings, the cable screeches and scrapes. It's uh, rather getting on my nerves. After more than three months, it's getting on your nerves, sir? That's what I want you to tell the men. Fraser. Look, old boy. I'm going to break out tonight. Yes, sir. When you've put your men to work, bring Alden, Lillis, Lamb, and Nisbet. I'll explain the reasons for my decision. At three o'clock in the afternoon of the 30th of July, I conferred with the two executive officers, the medical officer, engine room artificer Lillis, and the senior telegraphist Nisbet. I want to break out tonight at 10. I've asked you here so I could tell you my reasons why we should. And I want you to give me any reasons why we should not. Oh, I think all of us have had enough of this, sir. Yes. The delivery of fuel last night was important for two reasons. One, at least 47 tons of fuel will be needed to drive us to the open sea. They gave us 56 tons, which really leaves little to spare. That's right, sir. Tonight will be the last one for a month with the phase of the moon right for a breakout. The moon is due to set at 11 o'clock. Now, I've decided to slip away at 10, accepting one hour of the waning moon as an unavoidable handicap. Now, we'll need every minute of time if we hope to get past the big guns at Liang Kong before dawn. Yes, sir. Now, rains farther inland have raised the river, and traveling by night without a river pilot will need all the water there is to get us over the mudflats. Lillis. Yes, sir? If we come under fire, I shall ask for smoke, understand? Yes, sir. I think everything's in tip-top shape below decks. We'll do the best we can, sir. Good. Nisbet. Yes, sir? Wireless silence will be enforced until I'm ready to send a message. Then only flash procedure will be used. Yes, sir. Lamb and Fraser. Yes, yes sir. sir. I want to make Marne as splinter-proof as possible. Now, see to it that the wireless office, the bridge, and the habitable mess decks are sandbagged. If you haven't enough sand, use mattresses or cushion covers or canvas kit bags, anything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, make your preparations as soon as possible, but do no work on deck until after dark. I don't want you to be seen. Grease all the bright work to cut reflection. Now, you can do that during daylight. After dark, break out canvas and stretch it from the superstructure fore and aft to change our silhouette. Very good, sir. Now, then, if we are hit and sinking... I will beach the ship if it's possible to save lives. The ship's company will get ashore. 
Then, I will blow up Marne. If disaster does come, your main object is to reach Fu Chao or escape in junks to the open sea. Any questions? No questions. Uh, just one, sir. I wonder what old Major Kung will say tomorrow when he's dipped to private. Well, don't underestimate our Major Kung, Fraser. It's entirely possible that he arranged the oil delivery so that we would break out, so they'd have a chance to destroy us. Oh, I see they However, pass the word along to the ship's company. And good luck to you all. I hope we make it. At least we'll have a devil of a good shot at it. At seven, I ordered steel helmets to be issued to the men who would be stationed on the upper deck. At nine, I climbed to the bridge to accustom my eyes to the darkness. At three minutes past ten, we prepared to leave. Engine room reports they're ready, sir. Good. Order them to obey telegraphs. Yes, sir. Engine room, obey telegraphs. Rudder amidships, Winston. Amidships, sir. Half a head port. Half a head port, sir. Slip anchor cable. Slip cable, sir. Slip cable. Not a sound, sir. Not a splash. Half a stern starboard. Half a stern starboard, sir. Hard as starboard. Hard as starboard. Hard as starboard it is, sir. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. Sir. Yes, Fraser. The funnel, sir. Spewing sparks. Oh, blast it. Well, there's nothing we can do about it now. We've started. They'll see that if they aren't blind, sir. Shall I order alarm? Not yet. Port 15. Port 15, sir. Steady now. Steady, sir. Well, we've got round. Half a head both, ten knots. Half a head both, ten knots, sir. I don't think they see us, sir. I don't think they do. It did seem that our departure had gone unnoticed. We passed downstream quietly and without trouble for 15 minutes. But then a flare illuminated the river. Wind up from shore, sir. Yes, should we come? Probably control point. Another battery, too. The vessel of the port bow. Is that a vessel? Yes. Yes, it's a patrol craft. Keep it 15 port, Winston. Yes, sir. Read the death reports, Alden. We're closing the beach. Yes, sir. Is that the patrol vessel, Fraser? No, sir. Land battery. There, sir. See the flash? Yes. Full ahead boat. Full ahead boat, sir. What's the depth, Alden? Give me the readings. Six fathoms. Six fathoms. Five and a half fathoms. What's the patrol vessel going to do? Set a crash course in that ship and steer into her. Into her, sir? I want to pass as close to her as possible. We'll smother her guns. One thing, Fraser. Our trip is no longer secret. No, sir. The gap's blown all right. I wish 140 miles lay behind us instead of ahead. But it's better than sitting still, sir. Just a bit of starboard wheel now, Winston. Aye, sir. We passed Shui Kao without sustaining damage. Shortly before one in the morning, still at full speed, we passed Kaining under much the same conditions. At three o'clock, Langsha. But from the outset, I had dreaded the final problem of passing under the nine-inch guns at Liang Kong. Searchlights probing the darkness told us before we reached it that they knew we were coming and were waiting. Our only advantage was the breadth of the river at its mouth, and we used it, hugging the north bank and chancing free fathom water. I remember that the cool air of the open sea seemed almost tantalizing and unreal. We reached a point directly across from the fort, and one of their searchlights found us. Give me smoke. Make as much black smoke as you can. Right, sir. Make black smoke as much as you can. Starboard 20, Winston. Starboard 20. Starboard 20, sir. Zigzag. Keep us from getting a fix on us. Five seconds to starboard, five seconds to port. Count them yourself. Count them aloud if you like. Aye, aye, sir. One, two, three, four, five, port. Give me the depth, Alden. Yes, sir. One, two, three, four, five, 
Stop it. Eight and a half One, fathoms. Two, three, four, five, eight fathoms. One, Another two, thirty seconds, sir. Three, Give us eight, that, and I think we'll be safe. Five, Make more smoke. Stop it. Make more smoke. Seven One, and a half fathoms. Two, three, four, five, four. Seven fathoms. One, two, three, seven and a half. course for Hong Kong, Fraser. Half speed ahead, both. Yes, sir. Half speed ahead, both. I'm going to the wireless room. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, Nisbet. Hello, sir. And congratulations, sir. Thank you. It is good to feel her roll to the sea again. Nisbet... I want to send a signal to Commander-in-Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, have rejoined the fleet. Yes, sir. God save the king. I think that's all, Elizabeth. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ray Milland. Hey, uh, Hap, did you hear about the meeting? Oh, what meeting, Harlow? Why, the meeting of our American truckers this week in Chicago. You know, Hap, trucking is one of our most important industries, and it's the lifeline of the more than 25,000 American communities which depend on trucks alone for the delivery of their necessities. And that's not all. Right you are, Hap. For those careful and competent cargo conveyors can claim an unequaled highway safety record. Well, sure, with millions of accident-free miles every year. And that great record is largely due to the American Trucking Association's never-ending safety campaign, which Autolite is proud to have assisted for over a decade. Autolite salutes the members of the American Trucking Associations and wishes them continued success as the world's finest drivers. Next week, on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Richard Widmark in a dramatization of the most famous of all Texas feuds, a dramatic report we call The Hunting of Bob Lee. In weeks to come, we shall also present Mr. John Hodiak, Mr. Joseph Cotton, and Mr. John Lund, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Log of the Mars was based on the book by Lawrence Earle and was adapted for Suspense by Gil Dowd. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as Fraser and featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Charles Davis, Anthony Ellis, Jack Crucian, Raymond Lawrence, and William Johnstone. Ray Milland is currently being seen in the Paramount comedy, Rhubarb. And remember next week on Suspense, Mr. Richard Widmark, in another story based on actual events, a dramatic report we call The Hunting of Bob Lee. For the location of your nearest Autolite battery or spark plug dealer, or your nearest authorized Autolite service station, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Friends, uh, contributing your well-earned dollars to any cause is never easy. But when you give to Red Feather, you know that your money will help all your community health and welfare services. October is Red Feather Month, so give the United Way through your local Red Feather. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>